creative director and co-founder of the studio. Could you describe Journey to the Savage Planet? Yes, so Journey to the Savage Planet is a, we call it an earnest satire. Uh, you are dumped onto a strange alien world by Kindred Aerospace, who are very proud to be the fourth best interstellar space exploration company. Um, so they're full of hope, uh, but not a lot of equipment. Uh, and their, their goal for you is to explore this planet in its entirety to uh, turn over every rock, scan every creature and every plant uh, to help them decide if it's a potential future home for humanity. Um, but pretty quickly, you realize something's wrong with your planet. And uh, uh, there's a central mystery about who has been there before you, what have they done, and what was their purpose. How have you found the development of Journey to the Savage Planet different from other titles you've worked on? Games are, are a tricky medium. You know, they're the collision of technology and creativity. Um, so they're always intense um, and they all come with their unique challenges. Um, the joy of Savage Planet is that we have been able to A, start with a blank piece of paper um, and then let, you know, the the gameplay mechanics and the ideas we had uh, evolve over time and lead us to the, to the finished product instead of trying to force it into any particular shape of a franchise or an existing IP. So you've told us a little bit about the story. Is it very story driven, the game? No, not really. It's not It's not a particularly story driven game. It's a, It's sort of a, a, an homage to the idea of exploration in gameplay mechanics for me. It's, you know, we drop you into a world, there's very little set up except for what I've told you. Um, you have to build your own gear uh, based on obstacles that you find. So there's no preordained path through it, although it is, you know, a bit like a Metroid Prime sort of game, if you're familiar with that, uh, there is a structure to it. So you will come across an obstacle. If you scan it, it will unlock a quest to build the object that will enable you to overcome that obstacle. Um, and it's up to you to choose where you go and how you get there. So does, does Kindred Aerospace play a role throughout the game? The, they, they set it up and they, they, there are continual sort of one-way communications from Kindred based on decisions that you make or objectives that you complete. Uh, as they start analyzing the data you send back to them and as that mystery deepens. There's some pretty funny dialogue. Why was humor such an important part of the writing of this game? Um, I think it just came natural. I mean, I wrote it and it's, uh, well, most of it, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it felt like it was, a, it was a relief to write in my natural voice. I, I'm a fan of sarcasm. Just remember you did your best. It wasn't very good. But it was your best. And sort of bleak humor, and it sort of felt uh, uh, that the using a natural voice was was more authentic um, in the game, and so uh, that's that's sort of how it started. Uh, and it just seemed to resonate with people in you know in an industry that's often filled with you know excessively serious titles, which if you break them down, aren't always as serious I think as they would hope to be. Um, it seemed to be uh, a, a nice choice to differentiate ourselves from everybody else out there as well. And I think you can be earnest without being serious, if that makes sense. So, you know, the idea is that there is an earnest story underneath it, but the characters and situations you meet are ridiculous. Um, and sort of the combination of those two gives us a nice contrast. What kind of challenges await us on the Savage Planet? There's, there's sort of three axes it, it, it proceeds on. One is sort of physical navigation. So you'll find sheer cliffs and extreme drops uh, and sort of floating islands of a busted planet that you need to navigate through. Um, then there are, you know, a lot of the creatures don't mind you being there, but they're full of juicy resources, so you might find yourself, uh, you know, uh, engaging in combat with them. But there are some predators on the planet as well that will provide a, a, a bigger threat. And then I suppose the last bucket of challenges is kind of like this idea of spatial awareness where, you know, you as a player need to be aware of where you are and, and where other opportunities might be and figuring out a way to sort of uh, explore efficiently and, and well. So you mentioned creatures. What kind of creatures can we expect? They're, they're hopefully wacky. Like we set ourselves a goal. We pulled out a copy of the old AD&D Monstrous Manual when we started the game, you know, which was like fun because when I was 12, you'd open it up and you'd see these creatures and wacky ideas that you hadn't seen before. You know, and that those ideas were so dominant, uh, hilariously, you know, between Tolkien and D and D that, you know, everything's everything became elves and dwarves and, you know, and, and sort of very similar. Um, so we set ourselves the goal of making creatures you hadn't seen before. Uh, so they're as weird as we could get them. Um, obviously, you know, they still need to navigate and, uh, you know, engage with the player. So they're they're not too insane, but there's 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 a bunch of weird and wacky things you can discover. What's your what's your favorite? 
Uh, there's the one that's in all the treasures of the puffer bird, which is like a it's like a football creature. So we put in the ability to boot them around, which was which was pretty funny. My favorite is one of the more hidden ones, which we haven't shown yet, which is it's like a hyper absorbent cube. So it's like this strange gelatinous blob that you'll have to figure out how to deal with because it, it you, it's impervious to, to damage. So you see it, it looks it, it's, it's it, it reminds me of the gelatinous cube in the monstrous manual, which was you know one of my favorite bizarre creatures in there. Two-player co-op seems to be a really big focus as well in the game. How does that affect your experience? Um, I'm a big believer in, in two-player co-op. I think of it as sort of intimate co-op and therefore very actually collaborative and, you know, cooperative. Um, it's you and your, you know, your best friend or your partner or your kid, you know, versus the world that we've constructed. And, and I think when you have two players, you talk the whole time and you strategize and you, you come up with plans. Um, whereas even when you get to four, it tends to be quiet and anything beyond that is just a shared world. Uh, most of the time. So I really like the idea of, you know, you and, and one other person. So you've had such massive success in the gaming industry. Do you have any advice for our community who might be looking to get into game development? I think be earnest and and, and uh, excited and, and listen are always the best ways. It's how it worked for me early on is just trying to find the best projects and then finding the best people to learn from um, was good. And take any opportunity that you come across. Don't be better than any opportunity that you might see. You know, I started out making licensed games for Activision on the Game Boy in a strip mall just outside of Melbourne. So, you know, you can, <laughs> if you put your head down, you can you can, you can can find cool cool games to work on. Can you describe Journey to the Savage Planet in three emojis? Oh God, uh, I can, I'd say the laugh emoji, poop emoji, and then I would say the vomit emoji just because it's got green slime in it and we have green slime everywhere. We'll, you know, we're a new IP from a new studio and we put our hearts into it um, and we really hope you give it a chance. So find a friend and, and, and take a ride to the Savage Planet. Always carry the kindred value system in your heart.